Suicide is the leading cause of death in the first year after a mum has given birth. Of all the mums in Britain who have given birth in that first year, after six weeks actually, I think sepsis beats us in the first six weeks, but after that first six weeks, if a mum's going to die before her baby's first birthday, the number one reason is suicide. And I am so grateful that I am not part of those statistics. I imagine, like a lot of new parents, especially mums, Jill Skeen was both scared and excited about becoming a parent. I can remember it really clearly myself. The conversations I had with my wife, those final few weeks of pregnancy, playing out how would it all go, both of us, but especially her, imagining the perfect birth, holding our baby for the first time. What would all that feel like? For Jill, the birth of her daughter was anything but perfect, and the impact left her deeply shocked. She suffered from postnatal PTSD, something which is estimated to affect more than 30,000 women in the UK each year. I've spoken to Jill before, and she's been very open about her experiences. But what I didn't know last time we spoke was that in that period after her daughter was born, Jill attempted suicide twice. She now feels ready to be able to talk about that period of her life for speaking of suicide. Now, as always, a word of warning. This podcast talks about suicide in a really open and honest way. And if you find it too difficult to listen at any point, please press pause and get some support. And I'll give out the details for Mikey's line at the end of this podcast. And you'll be able to find links in all the show notes. Jill, give us a sense of context. How excited were you about becoming a parent? Um, very. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> get pregnant until I was in my 30s. We'd been trying a long time. Um, so we'd been on the sort of fertility clinic journey and we were towards the top of the list. I think we were due to start IVF in the May and actually fell pregnant in the April. Um, and incredibly excited. Um, I had a very fixed idea of what my pregnancy was going to be like, what my birth was going to be like. I hypnobirthed and I we actually had a bit of a scare when I was only about six weeks pregnant where we had a very big bleed, which actually went on to, to be you know, a, a clue to what would happen later. And we thought we'd lost the baby. We thought I'd had a miscarriage for about a week before they could scan and find her. And when they found her, something in my brain just went, right, that's it. This is going to be a positive pregnancy and we are going to do all the right things. We're going to eat the right things. We're going to exercise. We're going to, you know, we're not using the shampoo that's got the chemicals in it. This is going to be a perfect pregnancy from here on in. And I did all the birth prep, um, the NCT classes, and it was... Um, I wouldn't say a nice time because I was I was anxious given mm -hmm. what had happened and I was quite an anxious person. Um but I had no idea what was coming. What was the image of the birth that you had created in your mind? What was your mm -hmm. hopes, your aspirations, your dreams? Um a very natural birth. Yeah, I was under the impression that um, having done so much hypnobirthing and pregnancy yoga that my body was built to do this and it would be a very natural thing and it was anything but. Um, I suffered with quite severe pelvic girdle pain um, so I was very immobile towards the end of my pregnancy um, and so the decision was taken at term plus one day to induce um, and knowing what I know now, I would not have agreed to be induced um, because it wasn't a nice experience. You described what your hopes and aspirations were. What mm -hmm. actually happened in, in practice and reality? What happened 
through that birth after um, in, you were induced? So the induction failed. Um, the pessary was lost around the back of my cervix and it was really painful having it taken out. Um, they accused me of losing it down the toilet. I was like, I don't lose things. It, you know, it, was, it wasn't it was nice. Um, so they then took me through into the labour ward and they forgot to connect the synthetic oxytocin drip. It was a student midwife. She made a mistake. I was supposed to be getting fluids and synthetic oxytocin and she only connected the fluids, but she started both running. So she was checking the bag and seeing it going down but it was actually pulling on the floor underneath my bed. Um, so labour just stopped. It had started, it just stopped. Um, and we then had a shift change. When the shift was changed, I went from an inexperienced student midwife to a very experienced, wonderful midwife who noticed what had happened straight away and who rectified the problem. Um, and so labour started again. Um, but at this point, I think I was about three days in, I was exhausted. They had a policy whereby they wouldn't give you um, a drip with any sugars in it because they don't do that anymore. But I couldn't eat. Um, it was a, a zero sugar hospital campus, so I couldn't even have a drink of something sugary. I, I was exhausted. Um and I was in a lot of pain. Um, because of the pelvic girdle, my hips and pelvis were very, very unstable. And I'd been advised by a midwife and the um, specialist physio that I'd been seeing to not be moved um, whilst I had epidural on board because I wouldn't know if I was in the right alignment. Um, and so they, they didn't listen. And I said, don't move me. And they moved me anyway. Um, and they actually compressed some nerves in my back, which led to me having, you know, having to have surgery and, and things in the future. But I was in a lot of pain and they didn't understand why I was in pain. And they were like, well, you've got an epidural. Why are you in pain? So there was an awful lot of little things stacking up that, you know, my, my version of events wasn't believed my experience was being doubted. You can't be in pain. You've got an epidural. Um, just lots of little things. Um, and then that midwife who was who, who was lovely, couldn't falter, she went off shift and a new midwife came on shift and she was disinterested, um, grumpy. She sat in the corner and did paperwork and put her hand up to me and said, you're fine. Um, and she didn't actually examine me until she'd been on shift for, I think, two hours. And then she went, oh, baby's now back to back. You're going to theatre. Um, so very, very quickly, we were then spirited away through to theatre. Um, she sent my husband out to get into scrubs for the delivery. And he waited in the room for over an hour getting his scrubs on. And in that time... She told me to move myself from the bed from the labour ward that I'd been wheeled through in to a theatre bed. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't move. My, I'd had so much epidural because of the pain that my bottom half just did not respond. Um, and I'd also, it's a wee thing in the grand scheme of things, but there's a thing called mummy thumb that a lot of mums get. It's an inflammation of the tendon in the wrist. Happens right. a lot in pregnancy. I had that in both. So I couldn't even pull myself yeah. across. You'd lost your grip um, and everything then. I'd lost my grip. I, I just couldn't. And I was so tired. Um, and she stood over me. So I was prone on the bed. And she stood over me and she said, move or you'll hurt your baby. And when she said that, <laughs> I found it somewhere in myself to pull myself from one bed to the other. Now, I don't understand why she didn't get glide sheets and move me. I don't understand why she didn't get more members of staff to help lift me. It's part of your job as a nurse, as a midwife, to help, student, uh, help patients move. Um, they have winches. You know, all sorts of things could have been done, but they weren't. And she said this thing. 
to motivate me. And when I complained, I was told, oh, she was just trying to motivate you. What she did, because of what then happened, was set the seed in my brain that I had hurt my baby. So then when I was moved, they got a spinal block in place. They delivered my baby by forceps very, very quickly. Um, and I started to bleed um, and I lost four and a half litres of blood. I was coming in and out of consciousness. Um, my husband thought I was dying because of the, the volume of blood. And baby was taken out very, very quickly. She was placed on my chest and I was inverted because I was losing so much blood they needed to preserve the blood flow to my brain. And they put her on my chest, but I'm upside down and I don't feel safe. And this is this precious little thing. And they've put it on me. So the first thing I said to her was, get her off me, she's going to fall. And all that the midwife said was, she's not going to fall, there are wedges. I didn't know what a wedge was. I didn't know where they were. <laughs> um, now I know they're medical props that stop you from falling and she wouldn't have fallen at the time. Nobody was communicating with me. Nobody was letting me know what was going on looked to my partner for support. He was in a state of shock and not able to help. And, and even looking at his face, the level of distress he was in was making it worse. Um, so baby then started to have some breathing difficulties. Nothing major, but they wanted to take her to neonatal. At the time, I don't remember hearing anything about that. I just know she was on my chest. I shouted, they took her away, and they left. And what happened in my brain was I put two and two together and came up with five. So move or you'll hurt your baby. Baby's been taken away. I've hurt my baby. My baby is dead. And they're not telling me because I'm too ill to hear it because I might die. And that must have been. I, I'm I'm listening to you, Jill. As a father who's been in a labour room as well, and mm -hmm. I I cannot imagine what it must have been like for you. Mm. I can't imagine what it must have been like for your partner either. Um, no. Other than utterly terrifying for the both of you. Yeah. At the end, they sent him away. <laughs> and when I needed him, I needed him to tell me what had happened and reassure me. And they said, you go away home and get a shower. Really old-fashioned, like, attitude to dads. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you go away, son, and get yourself a sandwich. That was awfully hard for you. <laughs> but he wanted to be with me. But they took me away to a single recovery room. I woke up several times. I kept passing out and waking up in that room alone, unable to reach the buzzer to buzz for help. And all that time, my brain was convincing itself that I had killed my baby. Um, they then took me to a six-bedded recovery ward um, where most of the mums had their babies with them. Um, and I was there for 36 hours um, getting transfusions and baby wasn't brought to me in that time. They did give me a photo of her um, and I looked at that photo and I've got the photo now and I treasure it because it's the first photo of her. But when I saw it then, I thought I was looking at a corpse. <laughs> you know, my, my brain was not well. Um, and then after 36 hours, they brought her to me and I wasn't, convinced this baby was mine. I will say this over and over again. Most of the staff there were nice, but that one midwife who was confrontational, rude, aggressive, um, she made me so scared, so scared of them, mm -hmm. so scared to ask for help or be vulnerable. Um, and you are incredibly vulnerable at that stage, aren't you? Yeah, very. Very. And emotionally, I was broken. Um, yeah. So they brought me a baby and put me back on a normal postnatal ward. And nobody there seemed to know 
that I had nearly died of blood loss. They just um, told me to get up, told me to move, told me to... It was tough, love. Up and at him, pull your socks up. Uh, I was told to man up. (laughs) I was told that maybe I should stop at one, uh, that this childbirth thing was quite hard, wasn't it? And maybe it just wasn't for me. Um, And we were in for five days. And during that time, they actually stopped doing observations on me and told me I was there purely as a courtesy because baby was in neonatal. Um, She was still getting antibiotics. So she she was down there for a few days, then she was brought up to me and she would go back down there for, for antibiotics and treatment. So I was there as a courtesy so they could take care of baby. And during that time, I was told I was being lazy. You know, it was on my notes, query maternal effort. Um, My husband would come in and look after baby and let me sleep. And they seemed to have that same really old fashioned attitude to me in a modern partnership, a dad you know, Mm -hmm. doing the bulk of childcare for the first couple of days to let mum recover from childbirth is completely normal. Um, But to them, it was a a weird thing. And you would have lost all those really vital first few hours and days of that mother-baby bond of the skin-to-skin contact that that is so precious to you. Yeah, we didn't do any of that. And you know, by this point, I'd sort of realised that, yes, yeah, she was mine. And she had a birthmark and it, it it just sort of clicked everything in my brain that she was mine. Do you mind me asking, how was your baby? Mm-hmm. Was your, your, you mentioned, you said her earlier on, your daughter. Mm-hmm. Yes. Daughter, was everything she's okay? 11 was, now, which... She's 11 now. A healthy or chi- child or well? Yes. Yeah. Good. I mean, she had issues. At what point, Jill? After your daughter's birth and after these Mm -hmm. what sound like horrific experiences and events, which Mm -hmm. I suspect were were very traumatic from the way you've described them, but at what point did you realise that actually it wasn't just the event that was traumatic, it was you were actually personally traumatised by the whole experience Mm -hmm. in some way? I mean, I probably didn't reflect on that till over a year later. Um, I was surviving. That that was all I did. And I put my emotions in a bubble. Uh, good, bad, ugly, everything. So I was surviving. It was one foot in front of the other. It was... This was, she was only five days old. I had been discharged from the hospital and I thought getting home would make it better. But during the time in hospital where I was being told I was lazy and I should do more, my husband, to his credit, has admitted that he also was getting that message and that he thought I was just being lazy because all the medical professionals were saying that. Um... And it does quite upset me because I'm not a lazy person. You know, if they'd taken the time to ask my dad, my my husband, my mother-in-law, is this normal? Is she normally, like, shirk her responsibilities and go and lie down for a bit? They would have known, no, it's not. Maybe this is indicative of her being ill. Um, but nobody saw that. They, they saw me as a lazy new mum. And... I got home and I thought things would start to get better, but if anything, it got worse. Mark wasn't sure what was going on. He was basically caring for a newborn by himself. He didn't know why I was being lazy, but he thought I was. Um, And things came to a head mentally for me. I was septic. I was having hallucinations. I was having flashbacks to the midwife standing over me telling me I was going to hurt my baby. I was having flashbacks to looking at a picture of a corpse. I was having a very strong vision in my head that I was a bad mum. I knew 
that this was a normal postnatal experience because this was the message I'd been getting. Mm -hmm. This is a normal postnatal experience. You're not coping. Everybody else copes. Why are you not? You're doing this wrong. And I would think back to, you know, walking around Tesco and meeting a girl I knew who'd had a baby three days before and thinking, gosh, how did she do that? How am I so bad at this? And I... I'm the type of person that everybody said would be a wonderful mum. And I thought, do you know what? She'll be better off with everybody telling her that your mum would have been a beautiful mum. She would have been a wonderful mum if she was with us today than the failure that I was. So in a heady cocktail of that guilt, shame, pain, agony, septic ramblings, I decided to throw myself down the stairs. Um, And that, what was going through my brain was, this needs to end and it needs to end now. I can't, I can't do this anymore. This is normal and I can't. Other people go, but I can't, I can't. I just need it to end. But kind of in the back of my head was also a thought, look, if you do this wrong, because you do everything else bloody wrong, you know, (laughs) if you do this wrong, you'll break a bone. You'll break your leg and they'll take you to a different hospital and somebody might actually see you, not just this new mum that's lazy. Um, So was there somewhere in there then... Yeah. This was a cry for help to try to change the pathway you thought you were being forced down or had your mental health yeah. deteriorated so much by this point that you And no, I I wanted you, to I wanted it to end. I I you wanted was, it to end. I wanted to die. I didn't want to continue being a failure. I wanted to be I wanted it to be quiet in my head. I wanted to not see these visions of this horrible woman. I wanted to stop hurting because the pain was so extreme and the shame of being bad at this, this most natural thing that I had wanted for so long and you know I was 30 when I got pregnant we'd been trying since I was like 24 you know it it been a long time crystallizing in my brain this is the kind of mum you're going to be and I, I always had slightly younger friends and I was the mum of the group I'm mothering everybody I'm cooking for everybody I'm making sure everybody's safe you're going to be a great mum you're going to be a great mum. People say that to you all the time when you're on your fertility journey and, and it's hard and it's emotionally awful. And you'll, you'll be a great mum. However it happens for you, you'll be a great mum. And there was I failing at everything. I failed to feed my baby. I failed to birth my baby. I didn't think she was mine. I rejected her. I shouted at her. It was the first thing she ever heard out of my mouth. She will be better off with the idea of the mum I would have been than the reality of this messy, just useless sack of bones that is not able to even feed their baby. Most natural thing in the world. I could barely go to the toilet. I was exhausted. I needed a rest, you know, because I had sepsis. And I did not feel safe to ask for help. I thought I would just get what I'd had on the ward, which was, you're not up to this, are you? This is normal. Why are you not up to it? Everybody else is. Pull your socks up, man up, grin and bear it, get on with it. Were you able to talk to anyone at all, Jill, about how you were feeling? Family members or friends? or no. Mark thought I was being lazy. He thought I was being lazy and that was um, when I told him, how, when I tried to tell him, he was so overwhelmed by what he was having to deal with 
that he said he just didn't have capacity to look at it or talk about it or, um, you know, help me with it. Sorry, my dog's running a bit. Um, so I just thought, oh, God, this is me again. I'm failing and I'm wanting to talk about this and go over it and, you know, maybe figure out what went wrong. In that space, I felt so alone, so alone. And I don't think I stopped feeling alone um, till I found the Birth Trauma Association um, and found a group of other women who had had similar experiences. And all of a sudden, the clarity that I could see their experiences with and know it wasn't their fault. It and didn't m make it better, but it started to sort of open the door to that possibility that maybe I didn't do this to myself. How did you finally, was it through the Birth Trauma Association or was it through mm -hmm. other healthcare professionals? But how did you start to finally get some help? Because I remember from yeah. our previous conversation, you were you were diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder from your Mm -hmm. experiences um which you've described mm -hmm. today but how did you actually start to get help and reframe that you weren't a bad mum and you didn't yeah. harm your baby well I think I ended up being in and out of hospital for about two months um so during that time I did very very little looking after my baby um so bonding and attachment didn't really happen then when I got out of hospital uh, she was about two months old and I finally actually delivered what was left of the placenta and I thought at that point everything's going to start to get better and it didn't um my back was still in bits I was still in a lot of pain um my mental health was still absolutely rotten that bubble that I had built inside my brain was leaky um, but the bits that would come through were usually rage or pain or grief or shame or guilt. Things carried on like that for a couple of months till everything sort of came to a head, which is when I actually, you know, tried suicide again. Um, so she was about coming up for five months old at this point and... My husband and I were having an argument and it wasn't a big argument. It was a little thing. It was, you know, a little crossed words. And he made the mistake of stepping across the room and getting in between me and where my baby was. So she was in a, a wee cribby thing in the, the living room and he just stood in between us. He's not an aggressive man. Um, in that moment... <laughs> My rage was so extreme that if there had been something to hand, I, I would have killed him, I would have hurt him. And the realisation of that was completely overwhelming and reinforced all the bad things I was thinking about myself. And that I wasn't safe to be around my baby and that I was the worst mum in the world and I just really needed to go and disappear. So I left. I left her with him and I jumped in the car and I had my plan. <laughs> um, and I don't know how to describe what happened next, but I it was like I woke up. And I realised that I didn't want to not be here anymore. I didn't want to leave him with that pain. And I went to the GP. She had read in a journal about postnatal PTSD, which, to, I mean, to be honest, not that many people know about now. Um, mm -hmm. So to have a GP know about it, you know, 11 and a half years ago, was it was quite amazing. And we talked through it and she was lovely. And she said, I'll refer you to 
what there is for new mums, um, which wasn't great at the time, if I'm honest. Um, but it, she saw me and she saw that I needed help. How did that make you feel to have somebody, somebody recognised you? Somebody apologised and I, I just genuinely, the power, yeah, the power of somebody within the NHS saying, I am really sorry that happened and it shouldn't have. We failed you. And she said that, like, maybe she shouldn't have, you know, for their legal liability and all that. But she she said, we failed you. And I am so sorry that you've gotten to this stage. And to be honest, I didn't even disclose to her that I wanted to take my own life and that I was having those feelings regularly and that I'd made two attempts um, mm-hmm. because I was still petrified they were going to come and take my baby. Um, and it's... <sighs> Suicide is the leading cause of death in the first year after a mum has given birth. Of all the mums in Britain who have given birth in that first year, after six weeks, actually, I think sepsis beats us in the first six weeks, but after that first six weeks, if a mum's going to die before her baby's first birthday, the number one reason is suicide. And it's... I am so grateful that I am not part of those statistics, but I kind of, like I am, I'm so grateful to the me who was strong enough to not. And I I do see a lot of mums with birth trauma and and I I work charity work and stuff now with the Birth Trauma Association, Latinum. Um, And we see a lot of mums who have birth trauma and, and when you're in it, you feel passive and weak and like all these things are happening to you and sometimes you just need them to stop and suicide is, is a way out and I have no judgment for anybody who feels that because that was my way out and it was my way of thinking for the first year of her life. It was everything's going wrong, but it's okay. You can just end it. Everything's going wrong. You're doing things wrong. You're not good at this. It's okay. It's always your route out. It's always the the back door until I got some proper help. Um, That was the way that I thought. And to be in that and feel alone and to feel so unworthy of care and... It, it's so common and nobody talks about it because we're so worried. They'll think I'm a bad mum. They'll take my babies away and I love them. And, you know, I loved my daughter so intensely that a lot of the time she was the only reason I stuck around. But also the fear of shame and guilt of getting it wrong and doing it wrong and not even being able to birth her right was a big part of the reason why I thought I shouldn't be here anymore. Mm-hmm. So the narrative is it's it's hard to break out from. You mentioned Latinum a moment ago, Jill. You, you've set up this charity <laughs> to help other parents who find themselves... Mm-hmm in similar situations or after traumatic yeah. birth. But tell us about what you do, how you can support people. But also, I'm guessing your own experiences have helped guide and steer what mm-hmm. you offer and how you support other mums, because it sounds like yeah. that wasn't something that was there for you. Um, when I had my first daughter... I uh, was so unwell for that first year of her life. I didn't start getting treatment until she was m- over a year um, because that was the NHS waiting lists and that was just what it was. And in that time, I felt so cripplingly alone until I found the Birth Trauma Association, but that was all online. And there were no mums locally who had had anything like what had happened to me or who were willing to admit to the weakness or the shame or the guilt of it. 
go into baby groups. Everybody put on the makeup and styled the hair and the baby was looking beautiful. And, you know, it was, let's have a lovely maternity leave. Let's meet for coffee. I couldn't sit down. I was in so much pain. I couldn't talk because I cried. It wasn't wasn't something I could do. So Latinum was born from the need for the community of other mums and birthing people who are honest about their mental health. And I met a wonderful lady called Lindsay at a conference in Glasgow. I'd started volunteering with Maternal Mental Health Scotland and she had had a very different journey, but she had been hospitalised at the mother and baby unit with severe um, depression. And she needed other mums that she could speak to. And so we came together and Latin was born. And it's a safe place where you can say, I'm trying a new medication and it's driving me up the wall because I'm all itchy. Or I've got a new psychiatrist and I'm not getting on with him without clutching the pearls and oh my god she's got mental health Mm -hmm. it's a place where you can come and be safe to say today I wish I had never had children and for us to to know in your bones you love your child and it's okay to have those days because we all do and I think all mums even those who are ticking along with you know perfect mental health will have days where they question did I do the right thing here But we're so scared to talk about it. So Latinum is judgment-free. We have no... There's nothing you can say to me that I will judge you for about your journey to motherhood, your mental health, whatever it is. We provide that safe place. And part of that safe place is having the trained volunteers there so everybody is a mum or birthing person with lived experience who has then done mental health first aid training and and things so that they can keep a meeting safe. Um, We've got a big library of books that have all been recommended to us by perinatal psychologists. We can refer to counselling services. We can help with the cost of travel to your mental health appointments. We can, in some cases, and obviously it depends area to area, you know, what's available. We can support mums to access childcare so that they can go to a mental health appointment and say, I'm suicidal without their three-year-old chipping mm-hmm. in. What's suicidal? Because <laughs> it's really difficult to talk about this in front of your kids because the feedback loop of guilt is there. And... Uh, you know, you, you can't be honest. And then if you're not honest, you don't access the help you need. Is Latinum just an in-person support group or are no. you online as well? Yeah, we, we, we meet um, in three locations at the moment. We, the closest to, to Highland is Elgin. Um, and we meet in Aberdeen City and in Aberdeenshire in person. But then every week we have an online meeting. The time moves. Some more, some weeks it's mornings, some weeks it's evenings, so that mums who've gone back to work or you know it clashes with babies swimming, whatever, can join us. We don't cap our services. A, a lot of NHS services say that you should be well after your baby's one um, and sort of put you back into the general population. We don't cap. So we've got mums from bump through to to mums with school leavers um, because, you know, mental health doesn't stop when the baby turns one. So virtually we meet weekly in person. There's a meeting going on. If somebody from Inverness, Nairn, whatever, wants to go to Elgin, we can help them get through to our Elgin meeting. And Highland is sort of a development goal. (laughs) But you can sit there in the confidence knowing that a mum who is proactively looking after herself and seeking the right help is doing the right things. And that it will be... It will be okay because you can see I'm X amount of years down the road, too many. You know, we've got mums with five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds who come back and volunteer and they've been through their own journey. They maybe found Latin slightly later, but they are living well as well. So the volunteer group just show people 
how to that it, it will get better you can get through this well we'll put a link to latinum in the show notes of this episode Please, um, that would be as great. well and jill thank you so much for sharing your story on speaking of suicide today and for being so open with me thank you no worries thank you Dan. if you'd like to tell your story on speaking of suicide then get in touch with mikey's line and let them know and just to end our podcast day here's shona from mikey's line with a few thoughts to take away from our conversation today one of the things that i really felt listening to jill account of of her birth experience was the lack of kindness that she experienced not always but in some cases yeah and the one of the examples at the start there being accused of losing the pursery rather than it being lost it was she experienced that it was her fault and then later feeling like she was being told she was lazy and There's much we could say about suicide prevention, but one of the most basic and fundamental things in helping all of our mental health, I believe, is kindness, listening to somebody and being kind. Um, And I don't think we can emphasise that enough. Going back to Jill and to postnatal mental health, Jill really graphically describes the trauma of the birth and the horrendous experience of post-traumatic stress disorder that she experienced as a result. And the way that that sort of almost turned her mind on herself, that she moved from thinking of a way out through um, suicidal thoughts to taking action on that. And, yeah, her describing not not knowing her own mind anymore, the the horrific imagery that her mind gave her and her feeling incredibly alone um, in that. And where the hope came in was her having the courage to speak to her GP and the contrary, the opposite of what I was sharing earlier, her GP meeting her with such compassion and kindness and saying, it's not your fault, we can help. And then from there, it feels that's where the the story changed and help came. And of course, it took time, it took healing, it took um, therapy, all of those things. But but that's where Jill um, had the courage and uh, to heal and to not only want to live, but to create this beautiful life that is now giving voice to to more and more women who have similar experiences to her through her sharing her story here, through her setting up the work of Lantham. I think we all need to take courage from Jill and to break the silence and the stigma around mental health and specifically in this case postnatal mental health so that everyone can experience the support and safety they need. A huge thanks to Shona and all the team at Mikey's Line for the work they do. And don't forget, if you need someone to talk to or some help, then you can text Mikey's line on 07786 207755. That's 07786 207755. Or you can contact them via Messenger, web chat or on X. And the number for WhatsApp is 01463 729 treble zero. Or you can go and visit them as well. They're open seven days a week from 6pm to 10pm. And all the details of their address are in the show notes. Speaking of Suicide is funded by Mikey's Line and the platform is sponsored by Highland-based family firm D&D Paving. If you'd like to sponsor an episode, then do get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Speaking of Suicide is produced by Adventurous Audio Limited. Mm -hmm.